Uh, good morning. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, this week we are going to work uh, basically on the integration uh, between the React front end and the REST API server. So we are trying to put together all these two words that we've been developing uh, separately. Uh, we did this coming together already once when we were working with the plain JavaScript. Um, at that time it was easier because the JavaScript code, the client-side code, was just uh, uh, running on the browser. Right now React is also also has a, a server component, so we need to be a bit more specific of how, how we can do that. I know that it's a question that uh, many of you already uh, had in, during the groups, the chats and the, and the labs. Uh, how can we put everything together? How can we call the, the, the REST API from our uh, React application? This is basically uh, the topic of the week. Um, so, uh, we will uh, uh, first uh, uh, have a look of how to handle, how to integrate API calls into React. Uh, we already mentioned something, but uh, we want to be more specific, giving uh, some more guidelines. And uh, then we see some practical information about to deal uh, with the two service problems, especially during development. So we are not giving solutions uh, uh, that will scale to production with the uh, real web servers on real, uh, say, world-facing websites. We are uh, focused on creating a development environment and testing environment in which everything is working together. So let's keep that in focus. Our goal is not to achieve security or performance or reliability, is, uh, is to uh, achieve a, a, a good development environment. Okay. Uh, so let's start from uh, uh, how to handle the API calls in, in React, uh, so how to integrate uh, uh, REST APIs uh, into our application. Uh, basically, uh, where and when should we call APIs in a React application? So in a normal JavaScript application, it's up to us to call fetch uh, whenever we need some data or whenever we need uh, to, to update some information on the server. Um, because we are the total control of, of the application itself. In React, uh, we don't have the control of when uh, different methods are called uh, because they are being called by the framework itself. Okay, so we need to um, to understand where, in which methods, in which lifecycle methods, uh, it's best to put uh, the state of reading and state uh, writing uh, calls to the server. Um, and when we introduce uh, the server side, of course, we need to take into account that at every operation with the server implies a given sort of delay. Um, and so we need to uh, also take into account uh, for the, that delay in the user interface by giving, I don't know, loading indicators, spinners or some, something like that, uh, that may fill the content of a component until the component itself is loaded. Hmm? Uh, so let's try to, to dig into this um, um, topic. Let's just recall uh, that uh, in React, uh, okay, the main problem we understood that is the management of, of state at all levels. Uh, and uh, but we did um, uh, the, the, ty the type of state that we are dealing with with uh, can be different, okay. Uh, in many cases, we just have some presentation state or view state uh, that, for example, the state for controlling the form component or something like that, uh, which is not uh, uh, doesn't uh, doesn't need to, to be stored in the back end, in the back end because it doesn't need uh, to persist uh, until the next visit or even until the next uh, uh, web page. Mm -hmm. So it's something that is short lived, is only ma useful for managing the interaction and for managing some local components in the page. So this doesn't pose any specific problem uh, because uh, it's uh, um, normally handled with state and set state, uh, all the functions that we know uh, about the local state. Uh, a different uh, uh, topic is the, um, the entity state or the application state, so the state that is important at the application level, at the whole application level, um, where the, s the source of truth cannot be the browser. Okay, because uh, the real information will be in a backend, in a database uh, somewhere. Uh, so uh, the application should have, of course, a copy, a complete copy or a partial copy of this information, depends on the cases, and uh, uh, will manage that. But the real source of truth will be the, the backend server, 
and so um, every time uh, the application starts uh, it should retrieve data from the back end and then um, whenever the user modifies some data in, in the user interface of course we should update our uh, object our local state but this uh, local state modification should also be propagated to the back end so that the next time we, we visit the website uh, we can reload the new uh, data and this also creates a problem of synchronizing the remote state with the local state which is a very hard problem to solve in general uh, will not uh, it's not a topic uh, of this course is more the topic for uh, the course of distributed system programming how to manage with all that kind of asynchronous updates uh, without losing or without losing the synchronization mm -hmm. but at least we can have the feeling of, uh, of what's going on here in, in this course um, and this application state is usually tends uh, usually to be managed at the top level of, of the components so by if we apply the rules of uh, state lifting uh, um, then what what we'll find that in most of the cases this will uh, pop up to the uh, top level or nearly to the top level components of the application there are some um, solutions for managing the states uh, with the other other say, libraries that will add to to react but we are not dealing with those uh, uh, right now Um, talking about the remote application state or the application state uh, of course it is, will have um, a, a local component and a remote component so the application state is also stored or mainly stored into the rom remote database and we have the rest api in order to be able not to to access the information to query and to modify that and in the react community there are two strange terms uh, that uh, uh, describe what happens when we exchange information between the client and the server for uh, the exchange of the application state. Uh, the term dehydrating, uh, no? so making um, something without the water, draining all the water out and only keeping on the essential of, 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 um, of the state, means actually extracting the state from the data application and storing that into the remote server and this dehydrating uh, operation uh, should happen whenever we have new information so if the user enters a new data item or the user maybe writes a post or inserts some inf some information this information is of course immediately available in the local state uh, but then the application should uh, dehydrate it quickly uh, dehydrating wings uh, in this case uh, uh, storing it uh, into the server probably with a post or a, with a put uh, api call that will or, or a set of calls because maybe we are modifying different uh, <coughs> different entities in in the rest database um, so this operation should happen normally uh, as soon as possible so that the back end will not lose any updates that we do on the front end okay if the browser crashes or the connection is closed uh, we don't want to uh, lose some information uh, just because the connection uh, has been uh, interrupted and the state modification was held back into the browser waiting for we don't know which times uh, more complex uh, of case schemes of, are of course possible where we delay and we try to batch some modifications but it's something really more complex than what we are looking uh, into and the reverse, which is uh, uh, maybe more important or more difficult, is rehydrating the state. So it's a very strange word um, where we are trying to put the water again uh, into something that has been de dehydrated. And uh, in, in, the, in the React context, it means uh, retrieving the state from the database. So this is something that we should really knew, do uh, whenever the application starts uh, in Bootstrap. Um, because the application will start without knowing anything about what is the current value of the server components. So the first, uh, first thing we should do is to uh, recover the state and uh, uh, distribute the state information across all the components that need them. Um, and then um, probably also this rehydrating uh, uh, should be done periodically when something happens. So when, I, when something on the back end is changed, uh, the information should also be moved uh, to the front end components. Uh, basically, the, if we reason about the life cycle, uh, the best place um, to call uh, the REST API for redirecting the state uh, is uh, inside the component did mount uh, method. Um, because it's an asynchronous method that uh, allows us to call 
uh, backend uh, functionality and uh, to call the set state also mm. so uh, what we will see is will be something like this uh, in our components uh, inside the component did mount method uh, we can call a backend call okay and right now i wrote directly uh, the um, the fetch method but usually we will wrap this uh, this into some uh, um, uh, some, some api module just to to make it uh, sort of cleaner and uh, but basically in the component mount we issue the asynchronous call and uh, when the response will come uh, when we can uh, uh, get the information and starting with the information we are calling the set state and this rehydrate items is just a, basically a function that will take the JSON and will try to uh, mm, transform that uh, into the format that the state variables are looking for. So we're just moving or reconstructing the state using the properties and the list and so on. Because maybe we organize the state in, in, a, in, a, in some way for the ISO update uh, and the JSON that will come from the server will be different. So uh, we need to uh, reconstruct the objects in order to, to call the set state. So what, what happens here, uh, you, you see that we, are, uh, we have a, an asynchronous call and we have a set state call. So they are both asynchronous really. One is a remote call and the other is the set state. And uh, the, the combination of these two is why uh, we need to do this in the component did mount method, okay? Because in the constructor is too early. In the constructor, we cannot set the call set state. In the constructor, we could only um, uh, initialize the state with a value which should be available there. Mm -hmm. And the variable in, in set state uh, is not available yet uh, because it's, uh, uh, it, it will only arrive with an asynchronous call. Uh, so we cannot imagine blocking the constructor until the fetch will be completed. Mm -hmm. That will block all the loading of the application. We let the constructor build the first object with an empty state. This object will probably render, okay. And uh, the comp while rendering for the first time, component did mount will be called and uh, will start an asynchronous call. But uh, uh, you see that this set state will be called uh, under the, the fulfillment of these promises that will, may happen two three hundred milliseconds later hmm, after a run through to the server and uh, uh, this means that for this time uh, the rendering will uh, already happen and uh, uh, immediately after when this uh, promise when this fetch promise is returned uh, then immediately i will call set state again that will call will trigger a second rendering of the component itself so this is just a short time you will see how to manage that uh, but the um, component demand is the only place uh, when we may have these asynchronous calls and set state calls uh, available. In the constructor is too early, in the render method, render should be pure, so it should not have any, any uh, side effects, it should not call any remote methods, and should also be quick render, uh, we know, because it's, uh, it's, it will be called uh, many, many times. Hmm? Um, so this is the, the the best location that uh, everybody suggests to put this in for this uh, this rehydration of the state hmm? so when we read the state uh, the other way around the uh, rating is something that we should do during the updates hmm? so uh, imagine we have an, a list of items and we know we want to add the new item uh, so we pass an add item property to the list uh, and this uh, down the, the component tree and the uh, item will call some method above uh, to update the state hmm? so what we already have is that the add item function that we are going to pass down to my children uh, will have to call a set state uh, by adding uh, by creating a new array with a new item okay i just made it uh, a one line on here of course we'll need the more more controls uh, and more logic but uh, uh, for the moment uh, i'm focusing on the state so I'm updating the state uh, with a set state call that will update it very soon. At the same time, since I'm, dating, I'm updating the local state, I should also update the remote state. Hmm? And this is done by, uh, by calling an, uh, a remote API. In this case, it will be a, a post uh, for sending a, the new item uh, to the server also. Hmm? So in parallel, we are uh, updating the local state and updating the remote state. 
of course the uh, local state update will be much quicker in the order of maybe 10 milliseconds the remote one will be much slower uh, but uh, uh, will happen sooner or later we hope at least mm -hmm. and uh, of course the, the um, usually if it's supposed we don't need to do anything in the in the good case and when the the promise is fulfilled uh, the problem is when this uh, um, doesn't go well so maybe the network connection is lost or something like that uh, so this uh, would be the really tricky part uh, how to handle uh, the errors in trying to update the state hmm? uh, what should we do hmm? uh, should we uh, retry it later should we make a list a queue of updates that we missed for some reason and try to retry them later or should we try to roll back the state by saying okay at this moment i cannot uh, talk to the server so uh, the state update that i'm showing you was just temporarily i'm going back to the previous state there are all mm, possibilities all of them are wrong <laughs> i would say there's no be uh, best way there's no uh, universal way of handling with uh, this kind of uh, connection errors uh, so there are mm, ma many methods that you see around that try to deal with uh, errors in this uh, continuous update of the server so rehydrating is easier because you get the data when you get the data you display it if you don't, don't get the data you just wait or, or display an error that's it if you are saving data to the server well uh, the user assumes that whenever he enters something this will be saved and uh, it's up to you up to us to deal with possible uh, network errors or bugs or something like that okay uh, again um, we are not dealing with this topic right now because it will be more of a say, the distributed uh, um, architecture uh, topic uh, so basically what we are doing right now is to uh, implement two updates uh, in parallel so we are running a local state update and a remote state update in parallel and we are being a bit uh, optimistic okay we know we are we are running some risk uh, right now so uh, if we are using that uh, in production later uh, try to mitigate this risk with some more um, say advanced method uh, this is the basic uh, mechanism but uh, uh, it's not enough uh, because we are just uh, rely on the fact that nothing will go wrong and uh, you know that in computer science this uh, is very uh, right to happen um, talking about about uh, uh, rehydrating uh, um, it's uh, uh, we, we mentioned that the component that was uh, uh, uploading the state uh, uh, will render twice hmm? uh, normally the first rendering will be with the default state uh, that the constructor has set and the second rendering will happen after the, the, the state uh, information uh, has been retrieved from the server so there is a period of time maybe a fraction of a second but it might be visible to the user where the component should render itself without uh, any data so uh, it depends on what, what we want to do whether the default rendering of the empty component is acceptable okay we just live with that otherwise uh, uh, we could uh, uh, prevent the rendering of the component so having a flag uh, into our state that will tell whether the component has already been uh, dehydrated or not and if not we just uh, uh, don't display it and we will display it only when we have all the information and this is easy because we just need to have a boolean flag into the state by saying okay, it has been loaded or not and if not we return null in the rendering so we don't render anything so we leave it blank and uh, some part of the page will appear later or uh, we should uh, sh we could show a sort of a loading information uh, so a spinner Im image uh, or uh, just a text uh, with loading or some some information and uh, uh, that's easy to do this uh, because we can uh, and the component did mount uh, we can set the state to true by saying that uh, we started loading the information and we will set this uh, a loading property to false uh, on the after the the api client the api server has been um, called and, and will respond and we load the item so when we're ready to do the set state for saving the information uh, then we will also uh, stop uh, showing the loading indicator hmm. so this first uh, loading through will uh, happen immediately and the second uh, log loading false uh, uh, modification will happen when we have all the data 
and so this second will trigger of course a render and this render will have information about the, inform the, the, the data that we were waiting for so um, we do we avoid rendering a complex component uh, without the needed data we just show a weight in the indicator and so all the work will be into render and uh, that will uh, just uh, render a different component a much simplified version uh, when loading is true mm. uh, you you may be familiar with some websites today when you open them they are just sort of showing or flashing a, um, a fake version like twitter or facebook when you open them you just see a lot of gray posts uh, they are not real posts it's not your real data it's i think that shows you that okay in this area we will have a list of posts in this area we will have a list of contacts or whatever right now they are only gray and they will become colored or they have real content later on this is what is happening here uh, while this uh, the the real content is loading it's showing something that looks like uh, you know a, a, a draft version of the real thing so instead of just showing loading it will tell you something which is just black and white without any text or some a shadow let's say of what would have appeared there mm. totally uh, it's generated totally on the client side it doesn't need any interaction can be done immediately and uh, uh, the user has the feeling that something is happening mm. so that's the important thing the user knows that uh, this part is not going to be white forever uh, and sooner or later we'll get some information into that uh, but all the rest of the page maybe will start loading at different times so every component uh, should have the, its own rehydrating logic and when they are rehydrated then they can start working mm. uh, of course uh, until you rehydrate the component you want you are not going to render all the nested components so all the event tenders will not be activated so basically the user as long can only wait until uh, until the real uh, thing is rendered mm. um, but this is a, it's a, it's a very simple uh, it's a very simple solution for uh, for a complex problem so wh what to do while the contents are loading well basically just uh, we don't render the component and all these nested components until the data is ready but we are still a, a placeholder we can still show something mm. so what we show is just the work of the render method that it has but the render will just have a very simple check to do uh, loading true or false and the management of this loading is in the state it's a local state so it not doesn't, doesn't have to do with the application state it's just state for this component and uh, uh, it just manage uh, in this simple way hmm? so a yeah, simple simple solution uh, for for this problem um Another question that we may have uh, is uh, uh, which component uh, should call the API for rehydrating, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a question of, uh, we, we already asked ourselves the question in general, where should we put the state? Mm -hmm. And so we have all the state lifting, lifting uh, uh, heuristics that will tell us uh, to move the state uh, uh, where, um, where it belongs. So, so in the component that is able to pass uh, down to these properties uh, uh, portion of the state okay this is the next step um, okay a component holds a state and uh, who should call the api for rehydrating this state the component itself maybe it may be a solution okay uh, in general uh, you must fetch the state in a component which is above all the components that are interested in this data all the components that sh should show loading indicators while this data is uh, is coming and all the components that should be able to display error messages when this data is not available is not yet arrived is wrong or something like that so you you make a list of the components in your um, in your application and see if any of these components uh, need to know about this data need to show some loading part need to show some error message and when you have all this flagged all these components for these reasons usually you should try to find a parent uh, which is above all of them so that is the, the good place to call the apis for rehydrating the state mm -hmm. because then this component <coughs> can for example send the loading state uh, down to all the properties mm -hmm. And so all these other components will be able to show data, indicators, or errors, or something like that. Uh, 
it may be or it may not be the same component that holds the state uh, it, it, may, it, it may happen that the state that you are trying to reiterate is also it could be in a higher level component because maybe this information is uh, needed uh, more widely so this is not really uh, a problem because you have a state uh, a component with the state and the lower component that does the fetching and uh, the information of this fetch uh, will of course propagate down but the information on the state will propagate up so it means that the component holding the state should pass some properties down to the component that does the fetch like in a normal prop uh, in a normal event tender um, property change uh, property uh, function and uh, and so the fetcher component will call for example this uh, set state uh, uh, maybe is not on my state but it's a, a call to a level from my parent uh, that will call the set state hmm? so it's normal for us already to do that when a lower component will set will, will call a method on the parent <coughs> to change the state and the same goes here so there are two different responsibilities handling the state and handling the rehydrating of the state they can be on the same component or the rating can be below because it may be more operational or it's only interested for for some part of the application uh, so it depends in many cases and in, in, when the application is not uh, too complex probably most likely they, are, they will be in the same the, the two functionalities managing the states so having all the state update information and manage the rehydration of the component so reading everything in the component mount uh, uh, as i said in simple application they will probably be in the same component but it's not mandatory hmm? it's not mandatory okay uh, another just a final uh, uh, couple of recommendations uh, one is uh, try to keep your uh, fetch classes fetch methods uh, separate from the rest of the application so create a small library like i don't know api.js or, or rest or client something like that and put all the method that we call fetch inside this method and in, inside this module mm -hmm. and so that the all the um, react component will never all the uh, repeat all the react component will never call directly the fetch method mm -hmm. uh, they will only call these uh, api methods that will manage the fetch first because we don't want to mix uh, the concerns all the fetch methods are um, full with error handling details and com uh, com JSON conversion details and so on and we don't want to make the component more complex for that reason the same method can be used in different components so let's keep it separate for for, say, for clean programming um, basically we have a, 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 a deal of mutual not knowledge huh? or mutual uh, um, hiding of information uh, where the, all the APIs, uh, the API library with all the fetch calls should not depend on the React application. Should not know what is in the state, what is in the props. Uh, they, just, they just do their job. Give me the list of exams, it will give you the list of exams. What you do with that list is not uh, um, a problem for the API method. Okay? And on the other hand, uh, all the application nodes should never call fetch uh, or should never even know if the rest server is available is local is if it's remote or any, anything else they need this information they call the api we must just be aware that calling the api is an asynchronous operation all the methods in this api will be asynchronous methods they will return promises um, because they they of course uh, need to launch an operation that will complete over time and making the, uh, this separate is make it much easier to test the application by providing a stub method like we did last week we didn't have a real api so we just returned some fake data uh, if we replace this api layer uh, with real data not fake data well then most of the application will still work but with real data instead of fake data so in that case we are only working inside one file in order to swap a real backend with a, a stub or, or a fake backend that will provide static data and um, that will help a lot uh, that will help a lot in, in development okay so we can develop without uh, having the client and the server running and and uh, debugging both of, at the same time we can just split the development uh, 
and uh, have some clean interface to swap the two okay so that's a just mm, very simple uh, suggestion for for development and uh, uh, just putting everything together uh, we are uh, describing right now uh, two different applications okay so we have our react application that we focused on and until now in this discussion where we have the user interacting with the dom we have the react components that manage the states uh, manage the mounting uh, uh, operation the event tenders and so on and even now and then inside component mount or inside some event tender add item for example we need to call some api and this api this is just a module that we develop uh, for ourselves uh, that we call the fetch method and this is everything that the browser says the, 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 and sees hmm? uh, all the react application is running in the browser here the fetch method at that point will call an http call um, an http request to the server that will exchange some json data in the two directions of course uh, depending on get or post and um, and here we have our uh, rest api server so it's a different server somewhere else and doesn't need to share any code uh, it shouldn't even be necessarily in, uh, written in javascript right now for us we are just using javascript so it will be an express application but it could also be a java php or whatever application you want uh, python uh, language or whatever you prefer uh, we'll just uh, respond to the rest apis uh, in our case since it's an express we will define some routes for handling the different uh, apis and uh, these routes will call a database access layer that will in turn uh, speak to the real database okay so it's a long trip from the user that wants to insert some data or to sh show some data down all these layers to the network uh, to the route and to the database that will do the query and then all the information will go back uh, asynchronously this time to the user mm -hmm. um, so we are starting to think uh, should, we should always in our mind be very clear about where is this code going to run is this code running on the rest api server or in the react application and the react application means uh, in the browser even if uh, the react application also has a web server for providing the javascript files uh, but the real code is running uh, on on the browser hmm? we'll see more details about these two words uh, how they fit together into a single project in the second part of, of this lecture today uh, uh, um, a couple of more uh, information about uh, uh, dehydrating the state uh, um, we don't always need uh, to store the data permanently into a remote server there are also mechanisms uh, that are provided by modern browsers uh, for storing long-term information into the browser itself hmm? uh, so for example when the browser remembers uh, your logins uh, or remembers uh, uh, what you did in the in the application last time you opened that uh, um it means that some information is stored inside your browser mm -hmm. um, of course it's not a real permanent storage because the browser can be disinstalled uh, can be um, you can use different computers so the information will not move from one to another but it's some storage that is available for the applications uh, basically we already briefly mentioned that when we were discussing the um, browser object model we have a local storage and a session storage so there are two stores they are just uh, uh, objects basically so key value stores so when you can store a, um, a value to a given property they, this can go into the local storage and this information will be available whenever you query them of course this information will only be available to the same javascript that initially stored that you cannot just read the local store from other applications there's some sandboxing uh, of course uh, um, working there or something which and this local storage uh, stores information until uh, you delete it or until the browser will clear the, the cache or whatever uh, the second the session storage is something that is less persistent is uh, uh, you store something in the session storage and you all it only remains until you clo close the browser basically and closing the browser we just delete all the session storage and it's more for managing the, the state of the um, of the local navigation or the current navigation um, 
there is a, again a bit of a conflict or where the real truth of information is we have the react state we have the remote state and we have the local storage which is in the middle so from the point of view of react the local storage should be thought as a sort of a remote storage hmm? because it's a state which is not controlled by react a change in the state we cannot trigger uh, a re-rendering of the component so from the point of view of react uh, local storage even if it's local in the browser should be managed in the same way as we are managing the uh, the remote server so again i would imagine api layer for setting and storing and reading information in the local storage of course the difference is the speed the local storage is instantaneous you can read and write as you read and write from an object in javascript so you can store something there it will go outside your react application it will go inside the browser hmm? but it will not be permanent you cannot rely on that every time the user can uh, delete uh, the, the storage of their browser uh, and so maybe an intermediate level of information that will be staged there or saved there for a while and because maybe it doesn't need to go to the server or maybe it needs to go to the server later on and so but we already saved it in somewhere safer than just the react state which is highly volatile uh, so it's another possibility that we, we can consider in uh, in more complex uh, scenarios where we have different layers of storage, different layers of persistence. Some is local, some is uh, is remote, and we can update uh, the both. Hmm? Um, the the real advantage here is that it is synchronous and fast, uh, and so we can also use that for development. So uh, we have an, we may have a, an API layer which only works with the local storage so we can develop the application and then we will swap it for the real remote uh, um, api hmm? if we keep the api isolated it's very easy to this kind of swaps and uh, this also brings uh, uh, the other topic which is uh, data caching uh, so this kind of local storage uh, or the application state or the application context uh, can be used uh, for uh, caching some data from the server uh, it means that uh, uh, every time a component needs to do a get on the rest server uh, it will incur of course a time penalty because it will go to the server and make a request and, and so on and so the idea would be if i make a get i can also store somewhere <coughs> the result of this get so that if the same get needs to be redone later on i already have the response so having a sort of a storage of recent queries of course the get queries are idempotent so it's uh, <coughs> it's safe to do that you cannot do that with uh, state modification uh, methods of course but with the reading methods <coughs> you could store some information locally and uh, the api layer will uh, first check whether the information is already available and only if it's not available it will call the server so we are trying to in a way to save uh, some uh, calls from the server um, where do we put this information this cache well we can put that in the local storage of the browser we can put that into a special component that we may store into the context because this can be one unit for the context or <clears throat> or just in local uh, state so we can have uh, one component uh, that holds uh, the history of the course uh, uh, which is not really used uh, into rendering components but is being updated uh, or read uh, uh, by the by the component uh, need that, that wants to do the fetch actually so there are several solutions for this um, so it could be tempting say okay i don't want to lose much time during the same request over and over again um, but it's also dangerous so remember that one of the hardest problems uh, in, uh, in, um, in computer science uh, to get it right uh, is the um, uh, synchronization uh, in asynchronous systems in particular cache invalidation so cache invalidation means uh, if i'm saving <coughs> the results of a previous query uh, who tells me whether this result is still valid or not because the data may have changed in the backend, because the data may have changed due to some user action. So I'm changing some property, this property will get propagated to the state, but previously I made a get that only returned me a part of this information, and this 
information is no longer valid because I modified another part of it. And so I, we, I should I, I should invalidate some res some results that are the same data or data that is related uh, to uh, the one that we just modified. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complex problem. Don't uh, hope for easy solutions. Okay, we in the in this course uh, <coughs> we will mainly targeting the functionality, so making things work. And so the, all these kind of optimization that are crucial are essential when you go to large scale. Uh, we will not uh, will not be part of what we are trying to do here. Hmm? So don't over optimize because the risk of creating bugs or problems uh, is is very high. So the, the the reason why I mentioned data caching is not to tell you to do that, but to be very well aware of the problems and most likely uh, you want uh, you you don't want to do that actually to add this layer level of complexity. Uh, by the way, the browser is always is already doing a lot of uh, good work uh, in this caching part. Uh, for example, uh, you may have seen from the inspector that many times when you're trying to do a get, uh, the, the the server <coughs> will not uh, get for a list of items. For example, the server will just return uh, a 302 uh, call saying, "Okay, uh, this uh, this um, has already been um, sorry 204 code." Uh, that says uh, you already have this data so that it didn't change so you don't reload it so the normal caching mechanism and the browser knows that a get without parameters is idempotent it doesn't need to be redone every time hmm? so it's uh, um, there's already some level of uh, uh, avoiding redundant calls inside the browsers and so maybe you, you we really don't need all these uh, new layers uh, uh, or to make the, the, our application more complex Okay, that was uh, uh, all I wanted to, to discuss with you about uh, the, um, the client part. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now we, we switch a bit to the topic and we'll try to uh, discuss uh, what happens uh, in, in, uh, in development mode. Mm -hmm. So we know that uh, uh, we need two servers and uh, uh, we, from the picture before, one for publishing the React application and the other for publishing the REST APIs. How do they do, how do they live together? Okay, um, and this, I will try to see this from a very practical point of view. Okay, we again, with the focus on development and not in production. Okay, so um, I try to help myself with a couple of pictures. Um, this is the, our browser that contains the React components, and we know that uh, right now this component will call fetch even now and then inside uh, the API modules that is called by component in mount or by some event handler. Okay, that's normal. And this React application doesn't, um, is loaded from a server, of course. Uh, is the localhost uh, 3000 port that we are connecting. Uh, we didn't ma discuss much uh, uh, about what happens there, um, we just click uh, uh, when we do an npm start uh, and we just click on uh, or the browser will just open and we are interacting with the, uh, with the application. We know that the application is running in the browser so we didn't really care until now what happened on the server side. We knew that uh, the application must be loaded from a server otherwise the module doesn't work uh, um, because the, we, the, there are no permissions to load modules for local file, from local files. And so we needed a server, and we didn't uh, uh, much question that. Now we're trying to do uh, to 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 see that in more detail. Actually, the components that are running on the browser were defined into JavaScript inside the server. They will not run in the server; they're just being uh, distributed and passed to the browser by a web server, which is uh, called the React Development Server. So it's a special server uh, implemented or um, installed by the React scripts uh, module that uh, uh, is called when you call uh, create React app. And this server has special features that are just customized for development mode of React application. So it's, it's a custom server. In this custom server, uh, you it's not just Express. Well, under the hood, there is extras there, but we don't see it, okay? 
um, it's just something that is uh, predefined it mm, they predefined some parts predefined some locations and so on so to to start us uh, quicker into development mode and so actually you cannot write uh, technically you could but you don't want uh, to write your own routes and customize how this is working uh, the routes for the home page for the index for the app.js are predefined inside this development server and so we, we don't mangle with that we, it's just for us a black box that we're able to start uh, uh, to boost up our our react uh, application mm -hmm. and it has a lot of nice features like the live loading and so on that we'll discuss in a moment so this is what we, we were doing and on the other hand our application when it calls fetch we know that it will need to talk with some other uh, backend server which is different uh, we called it uh, the api server or the rest server and uh, usually we learned how to implement that uh, uh, directly in uh, with an express application and we're running it uh, directly by running the, the javascript file for the index.js or server.js how you want to call it which uh, contains all the routes uh, for serving the api calls mm -hmm. and this has nothing this server has nothing to do with react it doesn't understand uh, JSX, uh, it doesn't understand the React components, uh, uh, state management, anything in the React ecosystem. It's the same API server that we developed uh, uh, three or four weeks ago, and uh, it's only uh, able to respond to REST uh, calls. Mm -hmm. So to get on post methods uh, and we'll deliver data and, and exchange JSON information. Uh, so the two are really two different beasts. Uh, they have different goals, they have different ar internal ar architectures, uh, and uh, they are not the same, basically. Mm -hmm. So we need to live with the fact uh, that uh, uh, a React application, a real React application, in some way has to make these two halves uh, uh, live together. The half uh, that is uh, used for um, serving the React application and the half that uh, is going to um, serve the uh, rec, re, uh, REST APIs. Hmm. Uh, how, we ca how can we organize our work uh, to make all of this work? Hmm. Um, do we try to put everything into one server? So in some way we try to force the APIs into the React server or force the React uh, components into the API server? or we live with two separate servers mm -hmm. there are different choices we'll see uh, some of the alternatives um, the solution to the, to the answer to this question will be much different whether we are in the in development mode or in production mode uh, especially from the convenience point of view in development mode we want we want something uh, quick easy um, easy to modify pro possibly with the uh, hot reloading uh, modality and so on uh, for uh, debugging capabilities, step-by-step uh, uh, -step execution, uh, the logging on the console, and all these features that we need during debugging. During production, the main point will be security and performance. Uh, so we don't care about debug, we don't care about time for, for deployment and so on. So it's a, they are the really two different words. So the, the, the answer to the first question, how do we organize the two servers, is highly dependent on whether we are in production or in development. Hmm? Our focus, I repeat it maybe for the fourth time, but it's important to, to set the context. Our focus is the development environment. And we'll see that there are some tricks in the, in the JavaScript sandbox, uh, the so-called uh, uh, cross-origin uh, limitation for security reason, that will make our work, uh, our job, a bit more complex. Hmm? Uh, not much complex, but, uh, but a, a bit at least. Uh, so we need to to be aware of a couple more steps. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the possibility of, of thinking about two different servers uh, is, uh, uh, on one hand, it may be useful for separating the load because there are two different parts of the application, two different servers with different requirements also. The React server will probably have uh, volumes of clients uh, connected, but after the initial serving, it doesn't have much to do. The REST API is linked to a database, so probably it's need uh, it needs to receive uh, more more computer, uh, computation power but on the other hand it doesn't need uh, uh, to manage all the user interaction mm -hmm. and uh, so they are they have different requirements uh, and <clears throat> this is split architecture 
is also one another advantage that uh, this api server maybe is not the only one we may have many servers for different parts of the application the react application may pull data from different api servers is not a problem in this architecture uh, and uh, uh, this also implies that the api server may not even be our code maybe some public server that will offer some capabilities that we can call over the internet so it's not just for our backend but uh, maybe uh, may allow us to access servers uh, or uh, services from from somewhere else um, okay uh, we'll uh, analyze in a bit more detail uh, three possible solutions that are you know summarized by these three pictures and uh, one solution where uh, the browser will interact uh, with two different servers so something which is much similar <coughs> derived from the picture that we saw before that in runs uh, normally <coughs> it's a bit more complex to set up because we need to take into account the cross origin stuff <coughs> sorry uh, there's a another solution that i show here in the right where the react application server has a very nice feature that because it integrates a proxy server so it will allow us to uh, to run the two servers but from the point of view of the browser uh, it uh, only uh, it looks like like it's interacting with only one of them and in the middle we have the more complex um, maybe solution uh, where uh, the, all the React application is just bundled into static files and is being served by another web server. So we are getting rid of the application server. This one uh, will be more, uh, and is the last one that we'll um, consider, uh, is more towards the production environment uh, rather than the, the development one. I start, I already saying that at the beginning that our favorite solution will be this one on the right okay using the proxy server and it, it will be the one that we prefer to use during our our exercises and also during the exam because it's the quickest from the point of view of development hmm? it's the one that has less uh, requirements for the development point of view and it's, uh, it's it's faster to 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 to, uh, to implement actually uh, among the, all the these three so we have a look at each of them but ju we just remember that uh, uh, our favorite one will be uh, the one with the proxy hmm? which only runs in development hmm? that will also help us to remember that what we are doing here is mainly for the development environment not for production so let's start from the first uh, for discussing the first solution the solution is running two separate servers uh, and so we uh, install uh, an application server for serving the react application and uh, we run it with the uh, npm start and uh, we have a rest server for uh, hosting the apis these will be two different servers and from the http point of view this means that they should run on different hosts or if they run on the same host maybe in localhost while we are developing they at least should run on different ports uh, you see that here i have a 3000 or 2001 and of course here in the api server we are defining all the routes uh, for the get and, and, and post uh, and put operations mm -hmm. um, the browser uh, so it will receive the react application from one of the web server and will call the apis to another web server mm -hmm. and this is a problem uh, from the development point of view we don't need to know anything more than we already know today uh, because we just started a React project that will just internally call a fetch method to a different server that will be started separately. So we have two terminal windows. In one window, we start the or two um, uh, development uh, projects open side by side. On one of the projects, we are just starting the server, the REST server. On the other, we are just starting the React application. The browser will be started by the React application and initially we'll get information from the react application here and later on we'll just uh, talk with the server there is a problem here that by default uh, uh, the javascript code that is received from one server cannot call any api on a different server 
and uh, uh, to understand this topic uh, we'll have a very short uh, lecture here the, talking about the course uh, cross origin um, uh, problems and solutions that will allow us to uh, solve this problem mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, my suggestion for you now is to maybe stop this video and go and have a look uh, at the course uh, uh, short uh, lecture so that you can understand what we are talking about uh, and uh, uh, in the next slides we'll see how the solution is uh, in practice uh, um, implemented so if you want to see the solution in practice you can <laughs> see the next slides if you want to understand what is happening uh, my suggestion is also to, to have a look at this short uh, uh, explanation of the course uh, standard um, so in, in a few words uh, this it's a security limitation hmm? uh, so uh, what are the good and bad points of this uh, of this solution well the, it's easy because uh, we already know how to deploy these servers uh, we already know how to run them uh, we can run two or three different api servers on different machines uh, there's nothing that limits uh, uh, what we are doing um, and it's the, pos the, the only possibility if the uh, a REST API is provided by a third party uh, API provider. So if you want, if we want to call some API from, I don't know, Twitter or from Google or from uh, uh, some, I don't know, weather provider and so on, this is the only solution because the, the API server here, it's already hosted, it's already existing somewhere else. Okay. So we just need to call them and to understand how to call it due to the security restrictions. Uh, the problem, of course, we need to understand and configure the security restriction, basically on the server side. So from the client side, you don't need to do uh, anything too special. Um, and there's also security risk because if you are uh, um, opening too much the course uh, parameters, uh, then uh, your, uh, your server will be more vulnerable to other attacks or to other people that will try to read your information uh, when you are not, uh, um, when they should not be allowed to do that, mm. uh, and so one one common mistake is uh, to bring over the the course configuration from development when we open everything because we are on our machine, and the same configuration bringing that into production is a big the, a big security issue because we should close actually uh, all the all the all the paths that are not needed in production. Um, from the practical point of view, uh, we just uh, need to remember to enable cores uh, on the API server. So uh, the only important uh, uh, information that we, we need to know, like uh, we, we discussed uh, in, the, in the course video that I assume you already had a look, um, we just uh, enable cores uh, for all requests. In development, it's okay. We are just opening the course and uh, we know that the only ones that will call the server are our uh, React uh, components, okay? And so the, it's uh, for enabling cores for every request, uh, we just need to uh, install the course middleware without any option. The default options are very open hmm, and allows everything. In production mode, of course, we cannot, of course, run with the default mode uh, permissions and we should set something more uh, restrictive. Uh, so how this uh, integrates with our applications uh, I try to make a side-by-side -side comparison of what happens in the react applications uh, versus what happens in the API server hmm, from the point of view of the code so we imagine that we have a function uh, get courses for example uh, which is uh, inside our API JS so we know that this API will be called uh, most probably in a component did mount but the api doesn't care actually where it's being called we know that it's an asynchronous function because it will not return immediately the results it will only return a promise for getting the results and uh, uh, okay it's a normal fetch i basically copied this from the previous javascript exercises with uh, very slight modifications um, what you see is that uh, the URL where the, uh, um, the API is called is not the same server where the application is running. So the application is assumed to be running localhost 3000. Well, uh, the API will go to 3001, which is the other server, which is the API server. 
in fact in the api server we are uh, spinning up uh, uh, express on the port 3001 uh, in this case the host name is the same localhost and localhost but uh, uh, it may also be different so, but in any case we uh, the api should know where is where the location of the api server is hmm? what is the url for accessing the the the, the, um, the api server and this should be different uh, from the web server from the address of the react server itself at this point uh, we don't need to do anything special we enable the course uh, middleware here and this will automatically allow these uh, gets and put operations uh, that would be otherwise blocked uh, by the by the course uh, method uh, just be aware that if you don't use course correctly uh, your all your fetches will fail and you don't know why okay you just get a network error and this network error will be if you go and see all the logs uh, uh, it will tell you that uh, you you try to do um, an invalid request and the server will not honor that okay so uh, this is the the same code that we had uh, some weeks ago about the api server the only modification was to use cores here and this again with the same code the only modification was to change the port where the fetch is being called so uh, and of course we are we are not now calling this function from within um, a react component instead of just from a javascript code in, an, in a generic event handler so it is the easiest way we are not changing math much over what we already know uh, we are just structuring better and allowing the communication of the two servers with cores we still have two different projects to maintain to debug separately to run separately hmm. and, uh, and and wh while they're running that you will just communicate with them so the conceptually is the easiest one um, uh, there's a possibility because this solution is so common having two servers uh, where uh, they are both running on, on localhost uh, but on different ports uh, that the react community developed a, a, a preferred solution for that and inside the react server uh, there's already a feature that it will make uh, this combination easier and uh, basically the react application server hmm, which is just a development server so we will we'll never we don't need it and we, we don't want it when we go into production but it already includes a proxy capability uh, it means that uh, every re api request will be made by the browser to the same application server and this application server of course it doesn't know how to respond because it doesn't implement anything uh, but it will uh, proxy the request to the real api server so we are still running the api server on a different port but uh, uh, it's not being called directly by the browser there's no direct communication between the browser and the api server all communication is from the browser to the react application server and so the course limitation don't apply here because the browser is only making calls, even fetch calls, the asynchronous calls, to the same React application server. Behind the scenes, under the hood, the React application server will just uh, replicate the same request uh, to the real web server, to the real API server, and go back uh, and uh, give back the, the, the response. Hmm. So this mechanism is already being set up for us. Uh, it's already uh, re uh, ready and installed into the, the React application server um and uh yes uh, the, what, what the react application server is just uh, uh using, act, acting as the middleman uh, for for the request so that uh, um, the same request that the browser is doing here will be replicated there so it's just a transparent proxy from the from this point of view uh, it saves us <coughs> from uh, the hassle of uh, setting up a different url in the in the uh, apis here and uh, it saves us from the hassle of configuring the course there uh, course doesn't ap apply here because the caller of the rate api server is not a browser and the browser would, inf would enforce the course uh, um, um, security blockages uh, but it's a normal code uh, it's a service to server communication and in this case course doesn't doesn't apply hmm? there's no course handling into normal uh, course between different servers only the browser is very careful about uh, the core security why is that of course because the browser is running in the wild on users machines 
and uh, so we need to be very careful about uh, what capabilities we do to the browsers why this proxy is running on our development machine so it cannot we it's totally under our control so we don't need to enforce uh, more complex security filters uh, so that's good and uh, and also good and maybe better is that it's very easy to activate we just need to add one line into the package.json of the react application so create react act already creates all the projects with all the directories folders app.js index.js it's already been created for us and there's also a package.json file created automatically by the react the create react app, uh, script this uh, if you just add into this file the specification of the proxy well then the next time you start a react app uh, it will enable this functionality and so we we'll start proxying all the requests uh, of course it will only work in development mode because it only works when we are using the um, the react uh, development server okay where that includes this proxy for the production uh, mode we you we will need to find different solutions so how this how does this proxy work hmm? um, basically the the react development server has some um, uh, built-in logic for deciding whether a given HTTP request uh, should be handled by the development server or should be proxied to the API server. And the rules are very easy. Uh, every request for an HTML page, so when the browser is setting accept to text.html, is, server, is uh, uh, delivered directly by the um, React server. So this goes for all initial requests uh, done by the browser and in particular for index.html that contains all the application or uh, if the uh, uh, request is for my resource different for html and, 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 and an asset or something like that which is recognized by the server so the server knows which uh, files you have uh, in your project okay and uh, uh, if uh, the request is for one file that you have in your project then it will be served directly by the react application server so in a way the contents of the react project take takes a precedence uh, takes pr take priority over uh, the other contents otherwise if uh, um, the the request is not from a for an html page or uh, in any case it's uh, the request that not, doesn't specify anything which is recognized inside the react project it will be turned to the proxy okay so uh, in general if i'm calling the some api maybe slash api slash courses as an example uh, it's not there will not be an api folder into the react project so it will be passed to the proxy itself it may be a valid request or not it may correspond to an existing url or not uh, the react server doesn't know that the proxy uh, sorry the, the the rest server will know that and so uh, maybe this uh, attempt to pass the request uh, to the to the other server may fail or may be successful if it fails uh, well a narrow page is, is returned otherwise uh, the uh, the um, content of the response will be uh, given back um, to, so we are one single website that is a mixture of uh, resources that are defined into the react, in the react project and the resources that are um, defined into the rest api server and they share the same namespace they share the same url so a good practice would be to put all of your um, api calls uh, behind a, a common prefix like like slash api so not writing get courses but writing get api courses so that everything under api you we you know that will be served by the the rest server and everything else uh, should be served by the react application so we don't have any any confusion in uh, where is this uh, um, resource coming from whether from the api server or from the react server so from now on we'll try to to follow uh, this suggestion this rule to keep the namespaces separated so that uh, it's, it's clear for us uh, and we don't risk uh, having uh, um, the same uh, uh, the same name for two different resources um, 
of course this is valid for um, development mode because the react server only works in development mode uh, if uh, but the same mechanism can also be applied uh, in uh, production mode uh, when you have the website which is served by a, um, a real web server not the different one for example apache or nginx uh, that uh, are high, high performance uh, web servers and uh, you map uh, some portion of the document tree to the backend server so you can also do that uh, on uh, on other type of web servers that will uh, uh, statically serve the, um, the the react application and will proxy uh, the other the api request to another server so it can also it's a trick that can also be done in production mode uh, the difference is that uh, we are proxying the request not behind the react application server but behind another web server so we can we can keep that into into account um, in this approach which is i i mentioned it's the, our favorite one uh, we are still running two web servers on different ports uh, so we should remember to start uh, both of them mm, to start a react application and uh, maybe earlier we should start the rest apis mm. so uh, the the automation is just on passing the http requests uh, to the other server we should be uh, implemented in a different project uh, and should be started by its own node instance okay uh, the other uh, error is that okay we forget uh, that uh, um, course is not needed um, and so we are making the api server in a way more secure because the only co possible caller for the the api server will be the react application okay uh, so it's a, it's a diff we are handling security at a different level we are handling security uh, just by allowing the con or in at the network level so the 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 development server will only be called by by the by react uh, we could also if we want to to restrict the course uh, by enforcing okay uh, that the requests uh, so, sorry not the core but the the, the, the browser the server rules uh, to enforce uh, that the request can all only come from the react server and but we should be careful because uh, we are working here in a context where we don't have to care about course but when we are trying to move the the api server to a production server uh, well mm, it may bite us back because uh, we might uh, forget to re define the course uh, rules um, and so in, in production uh, you need to configure a real proxy a real course uh, security layer and uh, we also be sure that the same paths are apply uh, so with the, the mapping of the paths to the components uh, in that we have in production and the mapping that we have in, uh, in development should match otherwise uh, you have something that works in production but then doesn't work in, uh, in sorry it works in development but doesn't work in production because maybe the we forgot that uh, uh, in one case it's called api in the other case it's called api version one or something like that hmm? um, so we should have always have uh, that in mind uh, and this will uh, also involve the configuration of the web server so it's not just only your javascript code it's all of uh, let's say uh, operational issues about uh, starting and configuring the web servers uh, if you want to, to study that more, uh, there's also a possibility of helping you in starting both web servers with a, with a script, basically. So instead of going to a window, start the, the, the API server and go to another window and start the, um, uh, the React server, uh, you can create a script uh, that will start them automatically. There is one package uh, called concurrently in, in Node that will able to to, with a single command to run in parallel to different scripts uh, it's just some creation creating uh, node scripts and uh, batch scripts uh, uh, to put together and to, to run the two uh, projects so it's not nothing uh, is nothing comp conceptually complex or difficult I, I put two links to two different uh, tutorials that show different ways of doing the same uh, the same trick uh, they will only save you for writing uh, node index.js okay for starting the, the development server 
when you uh, when you start the react application mm -hmm. so with one start command you are going to start the two servers it's a, a very a very minor uh it's a gain so that's why we don't go into the details about configuring all of this because it needs to install additional packages and to change the package.json files uh, and modify the script so i uh, i'm not sure it's worth uh, setting that up okay for the for the gain that it gives us okay we are now to the we to the third solution uh, that we mentioned earlier uh, deploying a React application inside another server. So this is the uh, solution which is more close to what you will do for real, really publishing your React application. Uh, what we are trying to do here is uh, uh, to reconsider the fact that uh, React uh, runs in the browser. So it really doesn't need to run into a, some special development server. It can run in the browser provided that, some, that somewhere a server it will be able to to serve the index.html and the app.js and all the the component files okay um, so it, it just needs a, a web server where the react code is stored and then the browser will do everything else so everything will run in the browser and so all these files con uh, consisting of the of the react application can be moved to any server that we like and can be served from there um, of course we cannot just move the project as it is because the project uh, maybe is written in jsx and we need to translate the jsx to plain javascript and uh, and so we need to, in some way to transform the code into something that can be run directly without the capability of the react development server and this uh, is done easily by a, a, a command which is called uh, build okay so inside your project that have been a React project, there's a command uh, npm run build that will create a production bundle. So we create a directory called build that will store uh, all the contents uh, needed for running the application. And all of these will be just static, fi just static files. Files that need to be served by any web server and don't need to be interpreted by the server itself. And so we can take this bundle which is a director with some files in it, and move it somewhere else. For example, into an extra web server. Maybe also the same web server that we use for the REST APIs. So it's a way, it's uh, the opposite solution, sorry, it's the oppos opposite solution to, the, to what we did before. Before we were trying to hide the API server behind the React application server. Right now we are trying to embed the React application inside the API server. So totally sweet um the uh, build command is uh, is quite easy so this is a, uh, it's an actual screenshot for uh, for a for a build that run that i made uh, yesterday npm run build here this is what is printed uh, by the command so it will take uh, one minute or less than that and uh, it will take all your project and we create some uh, file sizes here uh and some some files that are called main uh, with some runtime main and 2.1 so there, there are uh, files with a hash code in their name and there are javascript files all these files are being uh, uh, compacted minimized uh, uglified and so it, they are really not readable no if you try to open them it's uh, really unreadable but what happened what happened is that these files uh, are copied under this new build directory mm -hmm. and this build directory contains this file that assume that uh, this will be a react application served from the root uh, directory of your website so you copy somewhere where the build directory will be the document root of your of your website if uh, the React application is not published at the root, uh, you can change that uh, by changing. Uh, it, it also tells you that you can change the package.json. There's an attribute called home page. You can change that so that you are telling the builder wh what is the name of the directory where the React application will run. Okay. At this point, the build folder is ready to be deployed. Um, it also tells you to go to this link uh, to find more information actually this link is not working anymore so this is the link that uh, you should really go to if you want more information and this is what we are trying to describe also in this part of the lecture 
what does the build command do well uh, it does a lot of magic uh, behind the scenes uh, most of the work in the building uh, is done by the babel package which is a transpiler from javascript to javascript and webpack which uh, is able to combine together different modules uh, you imagine that our web application is full of JXX, uh, is full of new JavaScript syntax uh, that may not be uh, available in all the browsers. And so Babel will translate all this new syntax into basic JavaScript code. And uh, the kind of translation that it should do are defined uh, into uh, some uh, properties. If you open the package.json file, you just look at the production property, it will describe uh, which browsers you want to uh, support in production and so we'll do all the necessary translations for supporting those browsers so it's a very declarative and powerful mechanism where babel will know what to do to translate your javascript code you can write thinking of a 2020 browser a modern browser of this year and babel will take care of polyfilling everything that is needed uh, for running also on older servers and how older should be the servers that you want to deal with you decide it by specifying the the, the browser properties here okay uh, and then after transpiling uh, webpack we is packing all the files together so whenever you import a module webpack is just taking the source of the module and including that in the same javascript file so we have one big javascript file that will contain your code plus all the modules plus all the react code and so on and uh, and we'll prepare an index.html that will load all these javascript so uh, what we have in sep separating in many different small javascript files right now is that I mean, it has been compacted into one single file where all the spaces all the new lines will be, have been removed uh, many function names are being shorted to one letter and so on so it's something very uh, small and uh, this content does not depend on anything else it doesn't depend on the uh, on the project it doesn't depend on the application uh, on the react application uh, on the script on any scripts uh, it only contains the necessary modules and it can be moved anywhere hmm. of course this also means that all debugging capabilities are removed so this is just a a black box that you can move and publish it somewhere and use it but you isn't uh, the build uh, folder cannot be used for development anymore and in particular if you want to host this build into the express server well it's very easy because uh, you just uh, go into the express server directory you copy all the content of the build folder from the react application wherever it is you copy into a build folder inside the API server. So the build operation will create a build folder in the React project. We, we need to have a copy of this build folder into our export server. For example, in a directory called build again, in the same. And we instruct the express server to uh, publish all the content of this build folder. So, for example, using the stated mid middleware, all the requests from stat for static files, so everything which is not an API, uh, will go. We look for the corresponding file into the build folder. So we are publishing actually as the root file or, or root of, the, of our uh, application the content of the build folder. We are publishing the content of the build folder that is the React application in the root of our website, of our expert website. Uh, if we want, we can also redirect the slash into index.html for easing the first loading of the application. And uh, at this point, uh, the uh, React code is running here inside Express. So everything is being served by just one web server, the Express one, the, the API server. And so in the ap application, we can just call locally these routes. There is no course involved again because it's a we are only have one web server which is running on one port so from the javascript call we can we simply call the apis from the same web server since this will be in with an api prefix and there will no there will be no api folder into the build directory this will not be 
let's say handled by the static middleware but they will be handled by the um, special routes uh, that we are defining into express mm -hmm. so uh, this is an, uh, another uh, easy way of, of solving, solving this problem i make a build i publish it into express and they just uh, instruct the static to serve those files to whoever requests them so our express will serve static requests concerning re the react application and serve rest routes rest um, apis uh, when we call the get and post methods over the api um, path names uh, of course uh, Again, it's easy to deploy anywhere. It's simple. We just build and copy a, co a copy folder. Um, and in this case, uh, you can uh, use this mechanism also in production hmm? because uh, uh, if you have already an existing web server in any language, not necessarily JavaScript, not necessarily Express, in any web server uh, in, uh, that will run your APIs, uh, you can also configure that to serve statically a given folder. So it's, uh, this mechanism is also working on, on in production in, in uh, more complex uh, cases. And, um, and the JavaScript code, thanks to all this uh, polyfilling and transpiling, uh, uh, is able to run on every web server. So all the cross-server issues uh, that were a problem in, the Java, in basic JavaScript development don't apply here because they're being solved by the backend without any um, performance cost at runtime because we are doing all the transpiling at build time, not at runtime, not while you are. So all the stuff, that, for example, some, somebody in the chat asked me, why is there such a slow start time, startup time for React applications? Well, because when we start in development mode, everything needs to be tra translated and transpiled and so on in real time. Uh, in production mode, there's no delay because all the code has already been translated and uh, we can um, it, uh, it, it will run immediately no? there is no uh, overhead for uh, supporting all these new syntax mm -hmm. uh, so the, the build actually is, is already the code that you want to run in production of course uh, the build cannot be directly modified so if you modify one semicolon somewhere uh, you need to uh, in the react application you need to save the file debug it in, in, in development mode uh, run the build script again that will create a new uh, build directory copy the content of the build directory onto the application server uh, onto the, the express server and uh, uh, reload the express server with uh, by closing it and re uh, reopening it or by using nodemon for keeping it uh, refreshed and refresh the browser so every time you modify one character, you need to go all through, through all the build, copy, restart, and refresh cycle. And so while your development is a bit uh, cumbersome, and so it's not very recommended. It's good for the final touches when the application is finished. Then you can deploy it and just everything into one project. The good part is that here we only have one project, the Express project that contains a directory with the Let's say, let's we call them read-only files. You you, will, you you don't want to open them. You cannot modify them in any way because it's not uh, they're not re they are not readable. Mm. Um, but it's a so it's a possible solution. And by the way, since we are discussing about the build um, uh, progress, uh, uh, I just wanted to show you a, a couple of other magic tricks uh, that uh, Webpack is doing while building the project. Uh, uh, well, we already discussed about packing all uh, all the important modules, uh, um, but uh, it also does a good trick of bundling together not just the JavaScript code but other types of resources like images and CSS files. Uh, I'm just giving you some some hints. Um, first of all, in development mode, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, the, the React development server, which is sometimes called also the, the Webpack development server, will uh, collect all the JavaScript code and will put it into one file, which is called bundle.js. So all this collection already happens when you start the Webpack development server. So that's why it's slow to start up. And uh, uh, it automatically injects uh, a reference to this file into the index.html. Um, 
it, if we try to open the, uh, the HTML source of a React application, you will see before the closing body, there's a, a script that calls this bundle.js. By the way, bundle.js doesn't exist really as a file. It's just a, um, a bundle which is kept in memory by the web app development server. That is make it easier to, to do the hot reloading uh, uh, features and the synchronization of the debug messages and so on. This is something that we are doing in development mode. So these are all features that uh, uh, the, the server is doing for us in development mode. Uh, um, but uh, and it, in this case, it means that uh, all the code uh, is in some way pre-processed by Webpack before before running. And this uh, uh, enables uh, handling in a special way some, some imports. For example, you, you, uh, you may have seen from the examples uh, uh, from the basic project that is created by the Create, uh, Create React app uh, that there are some strange imports. You can import an SVG, you can import a PNG. What does it mean? Well, of course, it's not the real JavaScript import because we are, we are not importing a JavaScript module but uh, it will uh, in some way read the, the file and include it into the, in the bundle so when you are importing something in this way we are instructing a webpack that we need this file in production and so this file will be copied into the uh, bundle or into the um, the build directory under a static folder uh, and uh, it does something more because if the file is really small, it doesn't even save it into the static files. It just embeds the code inside the JavaScript. So you can have an inline reference to an image if this image is smaller than a given threshold. So it's a way of uh, uh, referring to the image uh, with a, a JavaScript identifier instead of a string and at the same time to instruct a webpack that we need this file in production. And so please, put a copy into the build directory we can also uh, use the import for style sheets and uh, you can in every component you can import the fragment of style sheets that you need and all of this uh, uh, will be put together into one big css file so instead of creating one big file you create many small files every component will declare the classes that it needs for itself and uh, will be imported in the right module, the right component. So in this case, uh, the webpack is uh, putting together only, only the, the CSS files that are being used by our components, and then we will concatenate them into a single file. Again, we are stating the dependency. We are saying, okay, so please, uh, when running the build, uh, copy also this file. Hmm? So we are instructing that we need this file in, uh, in, in production, and we actually we don't we will not have this file specifically but we have one big file with everything inside there's another uh, syntax for importing css uh, which is uh, which happens when we import from a file called dot uh, module.css so if we call the file with a module css extension it will be imported in a different way actually it will not just be concatenated in a one big css file but the classes Will be renamed we will rename with an identifier which is unique uh, to the component instance so in this way we can define uh, class names uh, in, in css uh, which are unique to this component and so we don't run the risk of using the same identifier i don't know um, important urgent uh, main uh, main content uh, and the, the class of a div uh, uh, they may have different meanings in different parts because we are using components that were developed by by different people and they didn't agree on one global namespace you know css only has one global namespace of identifiers and this uh, css module trick is a way of isolating different namespaces because the uh, what comes out from the styles to primary class name will not be class equal to primary but will be class equal to primary one two three four five where this identifies has been mangled that has been modified to be unique to this component so in this, in this case you can use the same class name in the different components because you know that it will be uh, renamed to be uh, say unique and avoid any conflicts so these are sort of a advanced uh, 
uh, say topics uh, this uh, will again concatenate everything into the the big CSS file but before that it will just mangle the names we will just renames so uh, all this importing uh, is optional it's optional because the traditional loading, uh, so loading a style sheet with a link uh, or uh, loading an image with image inside the, the, the rendering method will still work, of course. And uh, we need to load that from the public directory that, uh, that will be also copied. All the content of the public directory will be copied into the, into the build uh, directory itself. So it will still work. But if we use this new, say, more advanced type of semantically advanced type of imports, uh, uh, then we have all the benefits of minifying and bundling together all the scripts all the style sheets uh, and so we will reduce the number of network requests uh, and also reduce the size and the load time of our application uh, if uh, there are missing files uh, you, uh, you you detect that uh, at compilation time because the import statement in JavaScript will fail so you don't wait uh, you don't wait until you run the application and click on the link to see that an image or a style sheet is missing because when you just save the file you see that there's a, a, a missing uh, uh, missing file mm -hmm. the import will fail and the import is made as compile time not at run time um, so you will find much sooner the possible name problems uh, missing files and so on and uh, all the file names already as uh, are you saw that in the in the build directory there was some string name like main dot one two three four five uh, these are um, hashes that change every time you rebuild the project so you never run the risk of uh, uh, forgetting to clear the browser cache and so we are wrongly loading the, the old version of the website so it's something that when you copy a file with a new version with the same name you should also instruct the browser to reload force the reload because otherwise the url will be the same and the file will not be reloaded in this case all this renaming will also save us from this kind of problems where we change something but we don't change we don't see it change in the browser huh? because we are also changing the names of the files so all of these details and also many more is what happens when you when you build a project using the the webpack and we'll try to exploit this uh, fortunately much of this is automatic we don't need to, to care about that we don't need to be um, to be really aware of all the details of what is happening uh, we should basically rely on the fact that it's uh, being well configured and the build process will give us everything that is ready to run without any strange dependencies everything is back there okay so uh, as, as I mentioned before we are we will work uh, with this uh, architecture in mind uh, when we want to go into production having something ready to ship uh, but uh, in the rest of the course uh, we are basically working with the uh, um, development proxy uh, for the ease uh, of, of the um, development uh, and we don't need to run through the, uh, through the build process every time okay so we can use all these import mechanisms that we saw that will be resolved at uh, launch time and not at build time but in development mode uh, uh, we also benefit a lot from all the live features so uh, the next step for us will be just to try to apply these methods uh, to some real exercise to some real project maybe we can work with a small one just to, to see the difference uh, in, in the of the three solution of the three options uh, and, uh, um, and and so that we can proceed uh, with uh, with uh, adding a backend uh, to our example applications and that is what we are going in the in the rest of the week thank you